Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 23, part B, we're going to take a look at the schematic for the prototype basic power tube matcher. And a whole bunch of tubes came in. And the R8, the Wilsonton R8, finally arrived. It must have been on a slow boat. Anyways, we've got a whole series of videos planned for the R8 and lots of tubes to roll. It's going to be a lot of fun in the coming month. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Okay, the most important thing with testing tubes is you must have a regulated, stable B plus supply to the plate. Let's take a quick look at the power supply requirements and what I recommend. All these sheets that I show you will all go below the video for, down, for your download option. And they'll also be in the store under information. So if you're not going to test direct heated triodes like the 300B, then the filament supply is dead easy. And I've outlined it here for you. Now, I've got the requirements for two tubes loaded into the tester the way I've set my tester up. Obviously, if you do one tube, you can have the amperage requirements of the filament supply, and if you do a quad, you're going to double it, right? If, on the other hand, you're going to test direct heated triodes as well as octals and as well as miniature nine pins like I'm doing, then your requirements are a little more complicated, and I've detailed them really all out here, I've outlined it, and you can just go through it at your leisure. The filament supply can be almost anything, so long as it's stable and the voltage is accurate. But I've got an option that I just found. Found it after I built the prototype, of course. And it's a mil spec, there we go, filament transformer by Northern Electric. Fa famous uh, equipment manufacturer in Canada and it's got a lot of options. It's got a 6.3 volt 10 amp, 10 amps, 6.32 amp on a separate winding, 5 volt 6 amp with a center tap so you can get 2.5 volts 6 amps off of it as well. Now, oops, there goes the pointer. The uh, <laughs> doesn't quite stay in my ear the way a pencil likes to. Now these things are heavy, so you may see them in the store and think, geez, that's a little expensive. Well, they're nine pounds or 4.6 kilos. So the shipping price is actually included in the selling price. And um, I should be able to get them to most places for that price. And the um, these things are like little little steel wrecking balls so you can only order one at a time and you can't add anything else to your order. They'll have to go out as a separate shipment. But anyways that would be a good option. You could even use these as a bench supply if you want a filament bench supply. They're rock steady. I've tested this one and of course I'll test them all as they go out the door. I have a whole bunch of them. Anyways, that's just an option I thought I'd show you. In my build what I did was I took a um, a salvaged EL84 push-pull um, transformer and um, of course it's going to do a quad of EL84s which gets us up and past a little bit our minimum amperage requirements for the 6.3 supply. I don't need the high voltage supply so it was a waste but it had a very robust uh, 5 volt supply. Now I found this in my scrap pile and that actually reminds me of a funny story. Years ago, I was in the shop of these two old fellows, and I asked them, could, could I have some stuff out of their scrap pile? And they paused for a minute, and they looked at me, and they said, Jimmy, that there is not a scrap pile. That there is a treasure pile. We paid good money for that stuff. And then they kindly let me go over and grab some stuff. So, there you go. Many of you probably have a lot of these parts sitting in your bin, including um, a transformer of some sort that will work as a filament supply. What else have we got? You're going to need a uh, negative grid supply, 
And we're going to look at that schematic in a minute. And you're going to need a very robust plate supply. And what I suggest you do is you just put it on a bench power supply. I have two large ones. I have a Fluke, which I absolutely love. And uh, the plate supply is absolutely rock solid steady when I run, run it on the Fluke. I have a backup HP. And um, I think this is the simplest and the best way to do it. Okay, let's take a look at the bias supply. Now, if you're familiar with my drawing of the of the power supply for the 6 or 12 SN7 2 pre, you might say to yourself, aren't those rectifiers all facing in the wrong direction? Well, you'd be exactly right. They are. This is a full bridge. And normally the negative would be on this side here going straight to ground and the positive would be going up to the positive rail. You flip the whole thing over, you end up with your diodes all facing in this direction, the positive goes to ground, the negative becomes our power rail at the top here. Now, I use the transformer I had. It's way too large, but it's still a compact R-Core transformer. It gives me a rock steady uh, negative uh, bias supply, let me tell you. Now, there's about a dozen different ways of making this. You don't actually have to build a full bridge. You could just use one rectifier and just rectify one side of the transformer. I thought, what the heck, I want to build a really solid bias supply for the tester. And I went ahead and did it the way I usually would build a, a, a power supply for, for a tube amp. So off we come. We're going to have a approximately a raw minus 320 volts DC here. Our first filter cap is 10 microfarad, 450 volts, and notice the orientation. Let's see if we can get a little bit more light on that. There we go. The positive goes to ground. The negative goes to the power rail. We have a big dropping resistor because our transformer is a little too large. That gets us to a negative 78 volts DC. We have our main filter cap, same orientation, positive to ground, bleeder resistor, and then we've got a rheostat, which is nothing but a high-powered variable resistor. And that slash through it, that shows you that we have a wiper or a variable resistor here. That's the wiper arm right here. And here we have a simple voltage divider network, 1K going to ground, and let's just take a look at that. I like these so much I put a couple into the store. Let's see if I get that up close so you can see it now. What this is, is one, one inside the bar barrel here we have a, we have a, a special um, resistive wire wound all the way around. A big circle all the way around here. One end of this connects connected up to our input over here. The other end uh, goes to this resistor to ground. And then we have a wiper. And what that is, it's always over on the side. When you turn this, the wiper actually goes physically up and down the barrel. I've got a larger one here so you can have a good look at it. It's hiding here somewhere on the bench. There we go. Here's a large one. Now you can see it more clearly. There's one of the connections. There's the other connection at either end of the wire. And there's your wiper. You see that big block right here? Watch it move. See it going, moving around? And it just physically picks up a different point on that resistive wire. And of course, there's your wiper out. This one's a 25 watt, 200 ohm. It's actually for a tube tester. Okay. Now, what this supply delivers, and this is the important point, what it delivers is a, approximately a minus 1 to minus 78 volts DC, which is what we need, and it's infinite of course, it can go anywhere between these points. Now you might say even a 2 watt wire wound variable resistor is overkill, and you'd be right because there's virtually no current on the circuit. I'll show you that in a minute. But what I wanted was physically a strong enough unit that could handle years of service. 
and that meant that I went with a 2 watt model. Okay, what's next? Let's take a look at the circuit itself. This is the one that Robert drew up. Here's our V plus supply we are just talking about, that our high voltage that needs to be steady. There's our negative grid bias coming in here to the input grid of the tube. Goes through a 100K resistor. We just talked about that, how we get that. We've talked about the filament supply down here. And here's the cathode. And we take our measurement off the cathode through a 1 ohm precision resistor. And it goes to ground. And missing in this diagram is a momentary switch. And we measure across that resistor. Now, you may have noticed that we've got the screen grid is strapped through a 470 ohm 5 watt resistor to the plate or to our B plus. And what that does is it puts this tube into triode mode. Trio, three. So one part is the plate, second part is the input grid, third part is the cathode. That's as simple as a vacuum tube gets, folks. Let's look at the next diagram. This is the same basic diagram, except that this is for a direct heated triode. And the big difference here is we've got only one connection does both the cathode and filament. Now, almost all the tubes you're probably familiar with, the 12AX7, the EL84, the EL34, the KT88, you name it, they'll have independently heated tubes in which they've got a separate filament and a separate cathode. In the early days of tubes, like the number 45 and later the 300B, these direct heated tubes, they had a combination cathode filament. So when you put your heat on the, your filament element, you're actually putting it on your cathode at the same time. They're all, it's the same thing. So your emissions come off here. And now, how do you control this tube? You control it with negative voltage applied to the input grid. This would be called a fixed bias tube. Even though we vary the bias, we would have, on a tube amp, we'd have a pot setting that negative bias voltage. More commonly, we'd cathode bias, and we'd have a big resistor down here, or a fairly big resistor, and maybe a bypass capacitor. But because we want to measure this, the emissions of this tube off the cathode, where there's there's no serious voltage down here. Just We're just measuring the current. All the voltage is up at this end of the tube. We could measure the tube up here and we'd get plate current, but the way this tube is set up and the previous diagram, if we measure the current at the plate or at the cathode, they're identical. There's no difference. You can break your line up here for fun when you build a tester and you'll see exactly the same measurement. It's much safer, though, to measure it down here. So what's going on with this no current on, on the, the bias supply? Well, take a look at it. Where does it go? It comes from our bias, our bias supply, and it goes onto the grid. It, so we're presenting a negative voltage, but it has nowhere to go. So it's not going to draw any current. It's just making the grid negative relative to the cathode. This controls how the tube operates, whether it operates hot, cold, or in its sweet spot. So let's just say we applied a minus 30 volts DC to the input grid. If we were to turn that down to minus 20 volts DC, we would see a significant increase in emissions in this tube. And we'd be able to measure it. We'll talk about that in a minute. And if we turn it up, let's say from 30 volts up to 40 volts, we would cool the tube off. We'd slow it down substantially. And that's because we're putting a larger negative voltage onto the grid. And that's how you control the output of a tube. One of the ways, anyways, with grid bias. So, moving on, we've got a momentary switch down here to ground. When you push that and you close this circuit, the tube 
is now emitting its connection to ground allows it to do that. Prior to that, all you're doing is providing heat to the filament. The tube is essentially an idle. It's got voltage present here. It's got a negative voltage. It's got a lot of voltage on the plate, perhaps 400, let's say. It's got a negative voltage here on the grid to control the tube. It's nice and hot here, whether it's indirectly or directly heated, it's ready to rock and roll. You close the circuit, and Bob's your uncle, the tube emits. Now we've got a resistor here, one ohm, one watt, precision, one ohm resistor. We've got taps on either side, and we've got our little voltmeter over here to take a reading. Now we're going to use Ohm's law to find out what the current is that's passing through this tube. Now it's dead easy. Let me just go and grab Ohm's law here for a second. This is one of those neat little wheels in which Ohm's law is divided up into four, its four main sections. It's current, it's power, it's voltage, it's resistance. So find out what you're looking for. In this case, we're looking for amperage. And if we know um, two of three um, items in the formula, we can find the third. So we're looking for the current measured in amps, symbol is I, so I equals E over R. That's the one we've chosen. I've outlined it in detail here so you can really look at it. But what does that really mean? So let's say we, we push our button, we, we've got an EL34 sitting in there or whatever, and we get a measurement of 20 millivolts. Well, that's not milliamps, is it? So how do we get milliamps? It's dead easy. We take our formula, so I equals, there's our voltage, 20 millivolts, over the resistance. Ah, we've got a fixed resistor in place, 1 ohm. That's why it has to be precision, because 1, 20 over 1 equals 20, right? It's dead easy. So our current measurement is 20 milliamps. If this was reading 30, it would be 30 milliamps. If it was reading 10, it would be 10 milliamps. That's all there is to it, folks. That's that's how the vast majority of power tubes come up with that reading you find on the box when you buy a match set. Okay. Well, that was fun. And a whole bunch of tubes came in. Let's take a look at some of them. Look at how this was packaged. Isn't that lovely? It was strapped with some kind of a duct tape. And when you see cardboard like that, that's the original sleeve, 1171. And here's a beautiful Russian tube. Now, what's that thing at the top? That is an anode or a plate cap connector. And if we look up really close, you can see that there's a little jumper coming across there. Can you see it there? Just just jumping across to the plate. And what this allows is normally, you're probably more familiar with tubes in which the uh, plate connection, the B plus, comes into one of the pins. The problem is you have a limit of how much voltage you can bring in this way and adjacent to all these wires and connections. By moving the plate connection to the top, we can have a much higher voltage plate. Isn't that just a beautiful Russian power tube? That is actually a 6N7C in Russian, or 6P7S in English, and it's a beam-powered tetrode. Now, they were used in TVs, and this is similar, this is an octal version, basically, of an 807, and there's no reason why this can't be used in a single-ended amp, and I love different stuff, and I think this is a really sexy power tube, so I'm going to put that on the build list, and we'll see what we can come up with. Okay, what else came in? Oh, talking about big tubes, look at this thing. This is a Raytheon Jan 5R4WGB. This is probably, these are all new old stock in the box. I've got a whole pile of these Raytheons and some uh, Citrons. I think that's how you say it. They were an industrial manufacturer of tubes, Citron, Cetron, something like that. They're very much similar tubes. A really half heavy-duty glass envelope, um, new old stock, new in the box. It, 
This is probably the highest spec 5R4 rectifier tube ever made. Look at those plates. Aren't they beautiful? And of course the base is heavy duty. It's filled with silicon. And the idea was that this would be a very durable tube. So it can handle vibration. It can take, I don't think it can deflect a bullet, but it can take a lot, folks. They probably would only buy one of these or two of these in a lifetime and never wear it out. Ah, now I wish I had found a lot of these. This is, people call this the best 5AR4 or GZ, 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 I don't know. I'm Canadian, but I can't keep my Zs and Zs right, ever made. Whenever you see a tube with Great Britain on the top, this is rebranded Hammond. That would be Hammond Organs. Um, but whenever you see Great Britain, your red alert should be flashing. Uh, maybe it's a Mullard. And sure enough, there's your manufacturing code. Let's see if you can see it there. It's a capital B, 9, uh, A3. And the 9 is either 69 or 79. Uh, the A is for January. And the 3 is the third week. Now, because uh, Hammond probably wasn't making uh, tube organs in 1979, this is probably from 1969. Now, I was shocked. And I mean, really shocked at how much new old stock uh, Mullards go for. But I've put it in the store. I've actually uh, made the price very competitive. It's still shockingly expensive. But anyways, it's in the store if somebody wants one. I've read comments in which people say if you own one of these things, they're so durable, it would probably be the only one you ever need in a lifetime. So maybe in the long run, it would be a good deal. What else have we got here? This is just a standard RCA 6SN7 GTB. And up until recently, you may have noticed that I haven't talked about these very much. And the reason is I just haven't been that impressed with them. They're fine tubes, but I never thought that they were great or really interesting 6SN7s. And then a customer ordered um, a match pair of the later version. That's the later version with the narrow base. The taller one is the earlier version. They're very, RCA 6SN7s are very recognizable. They have an offset flat black plate. I don't know if you can see it clearly there. Anyways, I always listen to a tube I have an amp for. And of course, I have a number of amps to play the 6SN7. And I sat down and listened to these, and I was absolutely floored. I put them in the 6 or 12 SN7 Pre uh, that we just talked about a few episodes ago. And the clarity and soundstage, soundstage especially, were unbelievably good. It just goes to show you, I've had this tube in the bin forever, and um, I've, I've just discovered it thanks to a customer's order. Anyways, there's quite a few of them, and uh, they, they actually are testing really nice and strong. So that, that would be a good tube to try out if you're interested in 6S and 7s. Now, in the tube collection that I bought recently, there were hundreds, probably about a thousand 12AU7s. And let me just show you. Let's see if I can find... A lot of these are rebranded. Ah, here we go. So there were lots of these Phillips tubes in there. And have a look at that. There's the symbol, the medical symbol. Those tubes were select for medical equipment. This is the later Amperex tube with the orange globe. So that's a later production tube. And look at this. A whole bunch of them actually had their bugle boys intact. That's really rare. This print is so delicate. Anyways, they're not in the store yet, but I hope to test them over the weekend and get them in. In that um, pile of tubes, there were also these telefunctions. Let me see if I can get one out. Quite a few of them still had their print intact also, which is always a good sign with a vintage tube. It means it hasn't been handled by somebody who's not so careful. There's your telefunken symbol, but if you can see it, there's always that sort of uh, boxy diamond in the base, embossed right in the glass. That tells you right away you've got a telefunken. I'm really hopeful that these are going to test good. When the print looks that good, that's a good sign that they have not been abused. And here's a really, found a whole bunch of these 12AX7s. New old stock. 
These are mil spec, um, Jan 12 AX7 WAs. They're so they're branded Sylvania and Phillips. Now Phillips uh, bought Sylvania in the early 80s, and you can recognize the Sylvania 12 AU7, 12 AX7 really easy. They have this corrugated plate structure that they use on almost all these small uh, dual triode tubes, different windings inside, of course. Anyways, um, I put these on, um, and I couldn't believe, I actually put them on um, with these RCA clear tops. A whole bunch of these clear domes were in the, a lot of people like the 12AU7 clear tops, and um, I put them on with these in one of my early preamps, and they just sounded absolutely wonderful together. I couldn't believe how good um, this vintage 12X7 sounded. Now these are all from the 80s, so they're actually not that old. Um, and that's a, something that's good to keep in mind. Uh, with vintage tubes, um, one of the things you've got to watch out for is you don't want, even a good vintage tube, you don't want a weak tube. You want at least a medium strength I prefer to sell medium to high strength tubes. The only medium tubes I really put in the store are really valuable rare tubes like a Telefunken or a Muller 12AX7 for example. And then I tell you, and I, 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 I reduce the price accordingly as well. There's nothing like a fresh either high testing vintage tube or a high testing new old stock tube. They just, the life in them is so much better than something that's all worn out. Okay, well that was fun. After the video, I'm going to unbox my, my R8, so I'm really excited. If you stay till the end, remember I've got $20 flat rate shipping around the world and free shipping on orders of $150 or more after discount. And stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers.